Welcome back, everyone. It's my honor to introduce today's session featuring two exceptional educators at the forefront of innovation and online learning. Dr. Sean Neufer and Dr. Veronica Estrada are here to explore innovative online course design using AI hands-on approach. Dr. Neufer, a Canvas guru with like a million followers on YouTube, serves as Senior Director of Teaching and Learning at the Community Solution Education System. His expertise lies in leveraging technology to enhance educational experiences and utilizing AI to revolutionize online course design. He is really a Canvas expert, but as we all know, that translates quite nicely over into Brightspace. Dr. Veronica Estrada, a core faculty member at Pacific Oaks College and adjunct professor at Pasadena City College. Dr. Estrada is a leading expert in emotional intelligence or EQ and its integration into educational settings. Her passion lies in helping individuals and teams navigate the complexities of human emotions in a digital age. And those of you that have had to work with me will be happy to hear that her work as an EQ consultant, Dr. Estrada has agreed to take me on as a client. <laughs> Dr. Estrada spoke with me earlier and shared her current passion, which is incorporating EQ components into online courses designed for dual enrolled students, really helping them to connect human to human rather than object to object, uh, emphasizing the importance of fostering empathy and connection in virtual learning environments. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Neufer and Dr. Veronica Estrada. Awesome. So we have on this title, we don't we have a slide deck, but it's going to be a little bit later. But mostly, I built a Canvas course, um, which is kind of like a, a bright space course, and that's how we're going to progress through our time together. And this is a course that you can enroll in, um, even if you're not. You know, you don't use Canvas at the institution. The QR code on there will take you to the enroll link. And so go ahead and snap a picture of the title slide here if you want, and that'll take you to our, our course. And you'll have access. We have some materials that we won't cover in this presentation that you'll have access to after today. And so I can leave this up for a moment. And... For people online on, on Zoom, you can also do the QR code just from the computer screen. So we want to, um, since we're new, I'm I'm from Orlando and Veronica's from Pasadena. And so we want to know where everybody else is, is from. And so we have a poll everywhere. We're just going to take a moment to get to know you. So go ahead and scan this with your phone if you could. And you're going to be taken to a map. And one of the maps is a world map. So we have people online as well that maybe you're in different regions of the world. Go ahead and drop a pin where you're from. If you're from New York, then I have a map of the state. And so it's going to look like this below here. So if you're from New York State, let us know where you're at. And if you're from the world, go ahead and, and let us know there. And I'm going to leave this QR code just up for a, a moment so you can grab that with your phones and you should be able to do everything from your phone if you wanted to just put your finger and drop the pin uh, where you're from or where you'd like to be from. Maybe maybe you want to be from Hawaii for today. Yeah. I won't I won't know any better. So as educators, we really foster relational learning to create a safe space in learning. And so this is why we want to do this. Our, our presentation today is very interactive. I know this is the last session of the day. Some of you are really tired. So hopefully our energy in our presentation can give you energy and we can start building these relationships just to see where everybody's from. All right, so I'm going to scroll down and you can keep that link up, that web page up on your phone um, throughout our time together. We're going to have a few more polls. So, what are you seeing, Veronica? It doesn't have Hawaii's right. It's actually on the line right here. It's yeah. it's straddles. So just dump it in the middle of the ocean if you're in Hawaii. We got somebody from Africa. Is that Botswana or something? And then New York State. We are spread out, aren't we? That's really interesting. Oh, somebody somebody wants to be from Hawaii. Or maybe you are. <laughs> Not making any of us envious. Our, our Ohana over there. Okay, I'm going to 
I'm going to reset the poll and we're going to ask another question now. So um, go back to that site. And now we're going to ask just how long have you been teaching online? You know, one, five years, five to 10 years, over 10 years, you know, just so we can get a gauge of, of ourselves. So we have some experience here, I would say. I'm gonna hop up, see if there are any more pins. So this is, is this about what you would expect, Alex? Like the, that's pretty good yeah. distribution of the- New York and New York. block from, uh, you know, across the US, we have a Midwest people here and there uh, tuning in right now. So yeah, it's good. So she says you you can't go anywhere in New York without hitting a SUNY within about half an hour from where you are. So she wants to oh, the, the QR code. Sorry, that's what you're I thought you wanted to look at the, the map. And if you actually take a picture of it, then you can go in your photo album and, and click on the QR code there as well. All right, and so our final poll. So more than half of us have been teaching for more than 10 years or so. And it's pretty good. And what that means, like online has changed so much in 10 years, five years ago, three years ago, one year ago. It's like different dispensations. So we want to do an activity. We're going to talk a, a little bit right at the beginning about generative AI in general, just kind of... Um, get a sense of what's out there, what are the fun things that you can do, and then we're gonna get hands on specifically with ChatGPT, knowing that there's more to the world than ChatGPT, but it is it, what people talk about, it's a very accessible platform. And so here's a, a thing we did, we went into Dolly, uh, ChatGPT4, and Veronica, we're, we're just playing around and we wanted to get, we took this picture from LinkedIn and it's like, let's recreate this and let's Disneyfy it. So we have like a prompt, let's turn us into Pixar characters or, or Disney characters. And so we have several iterations that we're gonna um, look through here. I'm having a hard time uh, scrolling, let me. And if you know Sean Newfer, he loves Disney. He's from Orlando, Florida. Yeah, I can see the Magic Kingdom fireworks from my bedroom window. So we're, <laughs> we're pretty hardcore, it's, <laughs> I have, I have a kid in kindergarten, a kid in middle school, and a kid in high school, and so we're all over the place, and we just gather. Disney is what combines us, I think. So we wanted to Disneyfy ourselves uh, with the prompt, given that picture. So we upload the picture. If you can see, um, there's there's some issues here. So <laughs> <laughs> so for so so we wanted to we wanted to we 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 see the picture, and it's like okay okay, AI, can you maybe make her Latina? Like, all right, so this is the second iteration. Um, there's still some issues. So I have, I have no complaints, I, personally, but I mean, <laughs> um, but you know, it's like, can we give her some earrings and can we give her the um, centenari? What is it called? The so I always wear hoop earrings, red lipstick, and I have a centenario, which is like the Virgin Mary. And so we asked ChatGPT. We first wanted to see if they even knew what that was. And so this was the result. So, <laughs> so we're getting there. She, <laughs> she's looking okay. Apparently they, they wanted to give me one also. And... And it gave me a, a trim, really a makeover. <laughs> um, I, I gave no pro. It just decided that it wanted me to be a little different, and so, and so now I'm I'm thinking, you know, I want to wear a Hawaiian shirt. I have this red Hawaiian shirt that I, I wear a lot. So, all right, let's make the Hawaiian shirt. Now it cut my hair. They gave me glasses for some reason. It took her glasses away. And um, yeah, short hair. My eyes are hazel all of a sudden. And so, okay, let's. Uh, can you give me blue eyes again? I don't wear glasses. She does wear glasses. Let's try this again. My hair's a little longer. And, and so. <laughs> and my hoops are getting bigger and bigger. I'm looking like a, a surfer, which I had, have no objection to there. And so we want to do, let's do one iteration. This is more of a flat design. And so, all right, that's, 
that's what AI can do <laughs> for us at this point. And I think it's interesting to highlight this because for one, it's a lot of fun. This was a fun activity and now we can use it in a presentation, but it also shows you there are opportunities, there's potential as well as drastic limitations. And that's true not of only the artistic multimedia uh, generative technologies, but when you're talking about ChatGPT Copilot, there's always gonna be limitations. And so it's not gonna give you um, something perfect, but right now it is is fun. And so now I want, does anybody remember several years ago, I'll, I'll see if the if the internet's good for this, um, but McDonald or Burger King did an ad that was generated by AI and they put it out and it was actually not, not well received. But does anybody remember that ad? If you don't, then it's okay, because I'm gonna play it for you. And so this is the ad that was created by AI. Oh, hang on one second, because the audio is actually uh, something important here. Oh, we have audio turned off. Okay, we'll try this again. The chicken crossed the road to become a sandwich. Burger King encouraged the chicken, made with white meat chicken, bit of lettuce for you to sleep on, bit of mayonnaise for extra sleep. The chicken sandwich from Burger King tastes like bird. BK logo appears. <laughs> So, an, an attempt was made. It tastes like bird. From bur I think you said Burglar King, which reminds me of the '80s with the with the hamburger. I guess that was McDonald's. Though. So I'm. So I took the the video from that, which wasn't AI. That was you know filmed. It was the text and the the reading. And I went in. This is a, a couple months ago. I went into ChatGPT four and said, can you re-script this so that it's more natural? And then I went into murph.ai, which is an AI uh, te uh, text to transcription thing, so it could do the voice. So it's this is a computer voice, and I just let the computer decide what it wanted to talk about, and this is the ad that I created. Savor Burger King's crispy, juicy, deluxe chicken sandwich. Flavor explosion in every bite, topped with fresh lettuce, creamy mayo, and served on a toasted brioche bun. Limited time only, so grab yours now. <laughs> Still tastes like bird because I use the video portion, <laughs> and I kind of like. I I think they should own that. Tastes like bird, you know. <laughs> that should be like the BK. <laughs> tastes like cow. <laughs> that would actually be an improvement over, you know. Let's go. All right, so um, I've got this. This freaking thing. Is this a question for us? <laughs> Online, is that a question for us? Feel free to jump in if you have a, a question for us. Was that a question for us? I think that was somebody whose microphone was on by accident. Yeah. Gotcha. All good. Okay, so now we're going to fast forward. Um, so this was a year ago. Does anybody remember the AI video of Will Smith eating spaghetti? or Jack Black eating peaches, or The Rock eating rocks. So I took two of those videos, Will Smith and The Rock eating rocks, and this was what was created about a year ago. And then, um, so this video runs 51 seconds, no sound, um, but then anybody heard, heard of Sora, the new open AI platform video? Now I'm gonna juxtapose what, we're, what, what we had a year ago with what we're seeing today. And this should be, this should be fun. The rock, the rock uh, cracks me up. I was actually, I was editing this during, during a meeting where I had to be on camera, but I wasn't really participating. I was just kind of taking notes and I was trying not to laugh because it's like eating rocks like a bowl of cereal. And okay, so this is today. This was just, it, you know, announced two weeks ago or so, Sora. And this isn't the highest resolution because um, I kind of condensed it so that we don't have to wait five minutes for it to buffer. But you can see some of the difference between these videos here. It's still a, a little bit uncanny. Anybody familiar with the uncanny valley? Like if, if you refer to that, um, we as humans, we're, we're used to recognizing faces and we're, we're used to reality. And if something is far from reality, we're okay with that. We can watch cartoons, we can watch The Simpsons and it's not gonna bother us. Does anybody remember the movie, The Polar Express with mm -hmm. Tom Hanks and the, where he was like five characters and it was all um, CGI. 
a lot of people had a hard time with that because it was kind of realistic, but very much not realistic. And so when something comes close to reality, but it's a little bit off, we feel very uneasy. And that's the uncanny valley. And so AI right now, a lot of times is kind of, it's kind of there. You know, if I um, go back to this shot of the car, it's actually very good, but there's something a little bit uneasy. This is, this looks more like a video game because you have essentially what amounts to a drone is following the vehicle, but with such precision that we don't really see that in Hollywood because there's usually a helicopter or, you know, there's a little bit of imperfection there that we account for. So when something's a little bit too perfect or if it's a little bit off, then we have a hard time with that. But um, look at the, the progress that we've made from a year ago to what we're seeing these days. And this is just based on text prompts. So you'll be able to, when SOAR is released, we'll be able to create videos for our students just by doing um, text, you know, and it'll generate something for us. Video um, IO is, video.io is kind of the same thing. So that's multimedia. I'm going to show you real quick because we're still having a little bit of fun. Um, this is a process. Anybody use Photoshop, you have generative fill options in Photoshop. So you can highlight portions of the picture and you can change it based on your text description. So I'm gonna place video. I take a, a shot of a, a house and I highlight the house. I say, I want a red roof on there. So it creates a few different houses and um, the quality is not great. Let me see if I can bump up the quality a little bit. So there's this big rock in the foreground. I'm gonna delete the rock. For some reason it created another house. So let's Go ahead and get rid of that house. And this is all just using AI. Um, I want to expand it because it's kind of portrait. I want to make it landscape. So it's going to fill in some mountains. Now I want to make it like a coastline. So I'm going to put some water and waves up in the foreground right here. And so it's splashing against the rocks and I see a spot of grass. So I'm going to put some sheep, like a flock of sheep in that grass. And it creates a few different variations and I can choose which variation I want to keep. And I can see it's kind of misty, so I'm highlighting this area and I want to put a rainbow. And so I'm going to select one of these rainbows and I want to change that mountain a little bit and make it more, you know, a little bit different. There's a big rock in the foreground that I just want to get rid of. And so I just highlight it and let's get rid of that. Maybe change the skyline of the, of the mountains a little bit, add some, some variation there. And now I see a blank spot like in the like a little prairie area I want to put more sheep over there all right and then I want to put a baby seal for no reason none of this has any rhyme or reason like there's no reason I should do any of this but now a baby seal is in the foreground and this is sped up I, I edited it a little bit the video um, it took about seven and a half minutes the AI does take a little bit of time to think it's not as fast as I showed it um, but you can see the initial image which Likely this could have been an AI generated image to begin with, but I wanted to make changes. I took out rocks, I added water, mountains and sheep and the baby seal and stuff. So you can see the before and the after. And I actually didn't need any Photoshop skills. I just needed to highlight the area and it was all text-based. All the changes that I made were, were text-based. And so that's, you know, that's kind of interesting. Now we have a, a poll question for you. So the same map, if you have your, your page up. Um, I want we want to ask you as we kind of get a little bit serious. You know what challenges are you facing as an online instructor or as an instructional designer, and specifically towards AI, but also you know if there are other general challenges that you want to to talk about. Then um, so we'll get this poll. And I'm going to. It could be your learning environment. It could be your students. It could be the quality produced, the quality of work produced, anything. Oh, okay. You got. I have to. Um, I have to activate that one. There you go. Refresh the page and I wonder if I can scoot this down a little bit. Those words are so big. Keeping student engaged, engaging students. 
Faculty cooperation, people participating at at all is at the end. Of, I don't know if something's off to the side, but yeah, getting people participating, engaging, faculty hired at the last minute. I have a story as an adjunct. I was notified about about three hours before the course opened. Hey, do you think you could teach this course? I'm like, well, all right. <laughs> Let's do some QA. As an adjunct, I was interviewed, hired within 20 minutes, and the following day, I got to teach my class. <laughs> the speed at which everything is moving. Now, I can speak to this because education, traditionally, um, we've been somewhat stagnant. We're not early adopters of new technologies or te uh, techniques. We like something to be tested and tried before we implement. And I'm speaking very broadly, not about this institution, but just as the industry of, of education, we tend to take things pretty pretty slowly. Um, and of course, with the pandemic and then with AI, we've really had to get up our, our comfort zones. And so I'd, I empathize and sympathize with our faculty um, who, who want a traditional method, but we don't have that option anymore. We've been forced to move faster than we're, we're comfortable with. And I feel like it, in my own opinion, it's a move in the right direction that we needed to change things up in education. We needed to, and we're going to talk about getting past the um, quizzing and discussion boards and the essays as a foundational as assignments and getting more avant-garde and innovative, integrating technology meaningfully and, um, and working to engage the, the students. And three years ago, that was kind of an initiative. And now it's a necessity. And we're not entirely comfortable. You know, we have to support each other. And if you're instructional design, you have to be empathetic to the, the faculty members um, that we need to change. But it's been, you know, it's been hard. And I think we need to acknowledge that within the industry. People locked in the past. Yeah, it seems like engagement participation, and this poll, this will be, should be available afterwards. Sorry, I'm kind of scrolling through really, really quickly. Faculty that are terrified of students cheating with AI, and it's not, not a topic that we're covering in this um, sessions, but just wanted to mention that students cheated before AI. <laughs> yeah, we talk about that. If students don't have a really good, strong relationship with their teacher, they're going to cheat. Right. And they've been cheating way before um, artificial intelligence. And if they want to cheat, they'll find a way to cheat without using AI. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next, um, I'm going to put up the PowerPoint. OK, so we can... it's really interesting, too, <clears throat> because it looks like engagement was probably the number one challenge of online learning. How long, about a couple of years ago, Sean and I won the innovative. What was it? Um, award, uh, award for engaging online learners through um, OCL, Online Learning Con uh, Consortium. And we actually created some really cool discussion posts to engage students. It's not like the read, write, respond, which is traditional. It was more innovative. It was more engaging. It got students to <clears throat> really um, interact with each other. And we'll probably touch a little bit on that. So here, we're going to ask another question because to engage people online, you got to ask questions, right? You got to do polls. You got to make it fun. We got to see what's going on there, out there to see what's really happening. So we're now really curious to understand and learn what are you afraid of losing with generative AI? What is it? Did you publish? Uh, yes. The QR code? <clears throat> what are you afraid of losing with generative AI? Now we're going to have, we're going to start the real conversations. <laughs> and we all know that learning is super complex, right? This one's a, a word cloud. It's a word cloud. So it's not showing up on the, oh, let me, hang on. I just need to exit the. Um, ah, so, ooh, I love that. Someone said the soul. <laughs> you know, me being a human, emotional, intelligent person, I'm actually really scared of, uh, ro robot is it called robotizing humanity, depriving heart and soul in learning, really moving away from that. So creativity, originality, 
originality. You know, I, I, I feel like 2023 writing. was a year of discovery, of learning, learning the tools and the potentials, the opportunities, the limitations. And I think that this next year, our our topics are going to shift towards humanization. And how do you, how can you remain human yes. in, in a classroom that has so much technology? Yeah. So we're looking at the art of being human during digital time. We see that scared of losing humanity, soul, truthful, um, thinking, creativity, originality, authenticity, just learning, right? We have a lot of students that are passive. That's where we're having a hard time engaging them, correct? They're coming in, they're doing the minimal work, and they want to get a good grade. And if they don't, you'll hear about it, right? <laughs> All right. So um, what's really interesting for me is uh, my fear is the lack of uh, human interaction and emotional support that students might not get with AI and online learning. Any comments? Anybody want to share anything? Any burning desires before we move on? Reflections. Reflections on what you're seeing here? How many people do we have online? Just out of curiosity. We have 85 online. Okay, got any, it. Any commentary from online that you want to share with the, um, the group here? Conversing is interesting. Retention. Nope. Empathy. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> we should have an SLO for empathy, right? <laughs> or humanity. All right, let's, okay, so, let's go. Well. All right, so let's start the AI conversations. Higher education has been the foundation of higher education was always built on curiosity, right? Educating the democratic citizen, getting them ready to be reliable and resourceful leaders, right, in higher education. But when higher education came to the United States, it was really on the premise of building character and scholarship. So I didn't see losing character <laughs> um, in the previous slide. And so as we're progressing in higher education and we got into the modern uh, college in the 19th century, there was a big push for innovation, right? Innovation, innovation, and higher education has been driven by that. And the value systems, uh, the traditions, the philosophies have always been driven by innovation, current trends, political events, right? And, the, and these cause shifts. And so we want to start off the conversations here of being curious. That is the whole press, press that's the whole uh, foundation of higher education. And how can we be curious with AI? What are the benefits of it? How is it going to help us? How is it going to create very specialized learning experiences for students? I myself, English is not my first language. <laughs> I'm considered ESL, I have a learning disability, I'm not supposed to be here. If somebody would have told me in second grade that I was gonna be a doctor of something, I'm like, what are you on? <laughs> I can't even pass like English. But I remember that they put me in front of a computer and I had a very special program that taught me at my level how to, how to learn. And so the third industrial revolution happened, what, in 1969? when we had computers, right? We had technology and it started to impact our classroom. Well, we entered our fourth industrial revolution with artificial intelligence in 2016. It's not going anywhere. It's not a, a new concept, but it could be a new concept for us in higher education, right? So I just wanted to bring that up because here I am, I'm fluent in English. <laughs> I beat my dyslexia and here I am presenting thanks to a computer. And I did have human interaction, right? <laughs> because that's something that we're not going to lose. Humans get to create the supportive learning environment. And AI is just a tool that's used to enhance but not replace. So hopefully, if we look at things like that, we're not replacing ourselves with AI. Because if we do, because another fear of mine would be AI generative work and then AI generative grading. And now it becomes object to object, but we're human, right? And we get to decide, we get to interact, we get to write those letters of recommendations, right? We build those relationships with students. So the human connection is so important, right? The experiences that students get, they're always going to remember their favorite teacher, not the best, their favorite, 
because they interacted, they created a relationship. Us as humans, we experience everything through our senses and we have something called the emotional brain, right? That we get to connect with others before we go into our thinking brain. So students are always gonna remember the way you made them feel and how, how, how much interaction they had with the student, with the professor or their peers. So how do we bring these experiences and how do we like build these experiences in our online platforms? So, Sean? So didn't we have a poll or not yet? Next. Ah, okay. So um, when we were, were curious about, when we're looking at, um, this is something that we coined. It's called creating AI psychological uh, safe spaces. So in order for us to create this, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about what we're scared of. We have to talk about what excites us, right? We have to have these conversations within these platforms and we're really excited to be here. And so also what's really important is our call to explore. Because we are educators and because higher education is built on the foundation of, a foundation of curiosity, I mean, why are you really surprised? I mean, we're, it, we're developing these thinkers to progress us as a society. Right. Think about how much technology has progressed us as a society. Right. Maybe not in humanity. That's a whole different conversation. But it, there's a call to explore. And so it's really important too to never forget that us, the individuals, the teachers, we're never going to we're always going to have a job because we get to create these experiences. Right. We get to pick what AI tool we're going to use as a resource. Right. We are we sail the ship. And AI is just a resource that we get to pick and choose. And so the only way that we can get in front of this is to get these trainings and understand what tools are out there to meet our needs to help teach students so they can learn. All right, Sean. You said we should sail the ship. It's kind of like AI can blow wind into the sails, but we have our hand on the rudder, you know? We, yeah. we know where the, we're going. All right. And so another here's another poll. How have you incorporated AI in your workflow or in your personal life? I know a lot of you love using, I love, yo amo chat GPT. <laughs> I really do. I've used it a lot for my consulting business, creating contracts. And I can, I can talk to my best friend who's an attorney. And I said, what's missing here? Because remember, we could use this as a tool, but us as humans get to fill in the gap right? Because we have something called critical thinking. And so we get to see what's missing and where we what we get to add. So now we're curious to see what have you been using this? How are you using AI in your personal or professional life? Rash Cooking. Letters of recommendation, a little round of applause for, <laughs> for that concept, maybe. Um, I, this last year, I went to our offices and I trained HR and I went to different departments and taught them about ChatGPT and about strategies that they can um, use artificial intelligence and um, and then I went and followed up and said you know how are you using it and a lot of um, marketing and HR are using it for for copy for helping them with policies or a respond to emails um, you know benefits and um, so see some of the some of the issues here. All right, so I, you've already uh, draft email. More powerful search okay. engine. Be careful. Is that you, that. Anne? But you know, Emails. be careful with every search engine. You know. Yeah. What's What's the purpose of Google? Mm -hmm. They Google wants to sell you stuff, and so the okay. order that you get a search, you know, the order of the websites is formulaic. You know, and mm -hmm. they don't say, "Oh, the top one is definitely the most scholarly." You know, rigorous and mm -hmm. academically, and you know, in integrity and all that. It's mm -hmm. like, no, they're gonna. They're going to push different agendas and AI doesn't have an agenda, but you have to be wary, you know, I, list for holiday gift shopping. I also want to add uh, something. So I teach in dual enrollment at Pasadena City College. So it's a community college and I go into the high schools and I teach a community college course. And it's interesting because I love talking to my students and I always ask them, I get their voice. How are you using AI? And so it's really interesting that a lot of them can't get access to it when they're in their in their public school, but at home they'll say, I use it to scaffold. I use, well, they don't use the word scaffolding, right? But they'll say, I use it as a tutor because I don't understand a math problem or I don't understand this concept. My teacher was going way too fast. 
So I use it as a tutoring tool. Uh, I use it to, well, how do I write my college application letters? I use it as an outline. How do I get this paper started? So I think it's really interesting that like ChatGPT can spit something out with 300 words in one minute. It takes us about what, three to five minutes to think of a concept or an idea or get our ideas together. And so I thought that was really interesting that students really like using these tools to create outlines, not necessarily cheat, but some, some, we can't all, we can't just generalize that all students are going to cheat, but they actually want to use this in the term. Well, like, for example, if a teacher is not accessible during the office hours for them, and let's say I had a student that told me, okay, Dr. Strada, this assignment's due at 11.59. I started at 10 p.m. Is my teacher really going to answer my question? So I'm using it because I need immediate response. I need to get clarity on what I'm doing so I can get it started. So you have those overachievers that start their assignments way ahead, and you also have students that wait to the last minute, and those are the ones that really need the help. Because are they really doing it for comprehension, or are they doing it to turn it in because they want to get their grade and they don't want to get their, their points docked? I mean, we're having real conversations, right? This is, we see this. You guys are laughing because you understand, right? We have those students. And they're asking, somebody said, play task roulette as <laughs> what they use AI. But AI, I mean, AI can be a tutor that doesn't take holidays. It doesn't sleep. It's 24 seven, no office hours, you know, and it can help explain things in different ways. You know, we as faculty are human with limitations, you know, and they can do it in real time. <laughs> All right, what's next? Oh. All right, so I want to explain my professional working experience with Sean. So he's the director of teaching and learning for the system. And so he, if he has a really great idea, he'll say, hey, Veronica, we've been doing we've been reading research for what, the past four years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have this great idea. Do you want to learn? I'm like, absolutely. I'm an educator. Teach me. From that idea, because I was on faculty council, faculty senate, I don't know uh, what you use here in New York, um, I'm able to introduce innovative ideas to the faculty because I'm faculty. Because we all know how it is that if an idea is introduced into our faculty space by somebody else, it's not going to be very well received, right? But if it comes from a faculty member, it feels a little bit more safe because it's coming from your own. So Sean has always taught me how to do um, certain things and I'm able to bring him into our space. Now, a lot of the faculty thinks that he's faculty because it's like, oh, it's Dr. Sean Newfer, bring him over. Or hey, Veronica, can he do a training? And so now we've created a, spa a safe space for him to come and integrate that learning to us so we can advance without having that fear of like, oh, am I going to be voluntold to do something? Oh, is this going to be on my plate? Or, oh, is this like a bureaucratic, like a directive coming down to faculty, whatever we're thinking as faculty. So here, that's um, our relationship. Is there one more? Okay. And then we also work with our deans and department chairs, but we work more with the, the Center for Teaching and Learning um, and it's so much fun. So that's how we're integrating these steps in, in our system is building those relationships, making it a safe space, bringing it through like faculty Senate during our time when we actually have a meeting, we don't want to have another meeting to have another meeting, right? Because we don't have the time, but that's how we're integrating it. And then he's able to send out emails if you want to join like workshops and trainings because in higher education, it doesn't seem like they're going to outsource and hire a company to come in and train us because it's so expensive. It looks like the train the trainer model is working really well or is like the preferred way of doing things in higher education. But how many people in your institution are efficiently trained with AI um, information, right, that can actually do this work? And so this is where Sean comes in and... Um, Oh, you want to talk about the element of risk? So that, um, with all of this, because the need for psychological safety and safe spaces um, with AI, but, you know, it expands past there. There's an element of risk, but there's also a risk with inactivity. And so, you know, we could try and ignore advances. We can try and ignore AI. Good luck with that. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, I think there's more risk um, trying to pretend like ChatGPT doesn't exist or trying to ban it from our students. Um, than to try and embrace it. And we're going to talk about how we can um, embrace that a little bit. Before we go on, uh, 
unrelated. I heard a, I read a tweet yesterday that, um, cause you mentioned like there's, well, that's another meeting. Uh, usually it's like, that's another meeting that could have been email. I heard that's another, e that's another meeting that could have been a fist fight. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it could have been more productive. Anyway. anyway, all right, back on top, back, back on task. That's John humor. Okay. How about you? Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so I'm circling back to something we mentioned earlier that in education, oftentimes we fall into this pitfall that course design, course design is hard and we have accreditation. We have, um, you know, so, so many tasks and sometimes it's just easy to say, okay, for this week, we're going to have a discussion board. We're going to have a written assignment and maybe we're going to have a quiz um, here and there. And that's what a lot of education, higher education has become is discussion boards, online discussion boards and written assignments, either essays or, or research papers. And I'm not here to say that we should never, ever do that ever again. But there's a time and a place. And I feel like traditionally it's been um, a little bit too much. And so we're here to say, um, and there's a tiny in the middle of that cross out, it says yawn, you know, because students, it's, it's banal, you know. It's perfunctory discussion boards. I can tell how many of my students log in at 11.50 p.m. to participate in that 12, that 11.59 p.m. discussion board. And it's like, I've read so many of the same thing, same discussion boards, and they're just over. And you have to respond to what, two or three other students and try and be engaged. And they're just checking boxes, you know, and we're talking about engagement and participation is those were top of our list of, of the poll. And so we need to rethink, we need to re-envision how we assess students in this world of AI. And some, in some ways, we need to embrace AI. In some ways, we need to create assignments where the students can't use AI to complete the assignment just because of the nature of it. So gamification could be one of those. And there's various components and a lot of research on gamification, but there's the component of um, competition that can inspire people, but also the, the component of um, achievement, you know, and so, you know, looking into platforms, this microphone represents multimedia. ChatGPT can't create a video for the students. It can't do, I mean, it can do voiceover because that's what I did with that BK uh, commercial earlier, but there's a lot of work that comes with um, oral presentation and multimedia um, productions. There's a lot of um, tools out there. You can do mind mapping, collaboration, um, real-time group work, even if it's online. You know, I think we need to work really hard to build our communities of learners because, and I'm, you know, I'll be preaching to the choir here. I usually don't have a dedicated online crowd. It's usually kind of mixed. And so you're, you're my people, but online learning could be so siloing. And just because everybody's on a list on the roster doesn't mean they're a community. So in online learning, we have to work so hard to, to engage the students, even if you're synchronous even if you're having a, a meeting a virtual meeting and you're all together for a moment guess what as soon as the zoom meeting's over one person needs to put the kids together one one need, person needs to do the dishes or the taxes and another person is taking a break at work maybe in a different hemisphere than we are and instantly we're in different worlds and we're siloed um, once again with the on-ground folks you know that's one thing it's hard for us to replicate is that when class is over, people are putting their stuff into their backpacks. They continue to chat. The material's fresh on their mind. The conversation lingers to the hallway and maybe to the cafe around the corner. And there's, you know, a lot of synergy. And that's where I think a lot of the, the good discussions come from is in those quiet moments that we don't have the luxury of on online. And then, um, this is a screenshot of a, a Padlet board. I don't know if you um, use Padlet at all, but um, later on, in, if you're in the course that you could en enroll in, um, I have some examples of assignments that utilize all of these things, but um, we've been working really hard to kind of break the mold and let's get the students engaged in different ways and interacting with the content and with the students and with the teacher mm -hmm. in different ways. Because um, if we're in online, mm -hmm. what's more siloing than a written assignment? that maybe the teacher is going to read and that's the only person. So can I jump on with Padlet? I love Padlet for my students that are creative and project based. So I do an introduction Padlet. They could do videos of themselves. They can show like music that they like, whatever it is. This is where they get to humanize themselves online to build 
connection. Cause as humans, we're all hardwired for human connection. If we don't do it correctly online, you will feel isolated. You'll feel disengaged and therefore you will not participate. Right? So the more you do it in the front end, it's going to have a lot more benefits. And so I also decided to use Padlet for, to do one. So I'm doing a, I'm teaching psychology and I'm having them um, pick a topic in epigenetics. And I said, use a Padlet have fun with it. And now it's like, oh, epigenetics, that's so much fun. Instead of like epigenetics, I have to write a paper on this. So I see a shift in their interest. I see their shift in their wanting to learn because it's a different platform and Padlet, you know, it's, it's so much fun. You could do so much with it. If you're not familiar with Padlet, another thing that I've been doing too, is I'm, because I am into emotional intelligence, right? I have, we have to teach people, the art of being human, right? So I um, ask students to be their own case study and use themselves to apply the theory. ChatGPT isn't going to know who Veronica Estrada is. In fact, I put my LinkedIn to ChatGPT to ask me to help me write like a bio and it thought I was a medical doctor instead of a, exactly, it's fake news, right? So I've been having so much fun teaching students how to apply these theories into their lived experiences so they can connect with themselves. And they'll be like, oh, I never knew this is why I did that because they're not paying attention to their own human experience. So I've noticed that there's been a lot more engagement when things are controversial or personalized. If they're able to personalize things and understand more about themselves, it doesn't become memory anymore. It's becoming understanding because it's relevant to them. If they're able to connect something to their long-term memory that relates to them, they're going to remember the concept. They're going to understand the concept. They're not memorizing the concept just to have to get the grade. Um, last thing about the, the assessment. When, when you talk about things like quizzes, Quizzes are rarely a good engage, um, a good gauge of things like creativity, problem solving, um, critical thinking. You know, even discussion boards have the potential, but the way the way that a lot of us do discussion boards, the students can get by, get the grade with minimal effort. And so, if they choose to be engaged, then that's kind of their choice. But um, I think another conversation that we need to have is around student success. What does student success mean? And this can be different at your department level for your course, your own teaching philosophy, but at your institution and at multiple institutions and across our industry. So we have this little bubble of student success. What can it, it mean? Um, as we were thinking, we came up with some, some thoughts. It could mean grades, you know, obviously if you get good grades, maybe that's successful. Time to completion, engagement or screen time or seat time, whatever engagement means. It could be job placement or postgraduate success, which could include job placement, but also that they do well in their career. Retention, I mean, we can't ignore the fact that retention is important for a lot of academic institutions, especially those that are driven by tuition. You know, that's, also, that's gonna be something they have to look at. Maybe comprehension that our students actually understand or that they can demonstrate competencies of the materials that we're teaching them that might be important um, you, we might prioritize attendance or engagement with technology or digital literacy critical thinking and problem solving skills or writing skills or research and information literacy or career readiness or um, employability skills or maybe even health and well-being and mindfulness and i mean all of these could be part of the student the definition of student success. And maybe we could even ask the students how, what they consider to be success. What do they want to get out of, you know, shared governance elected. We should uh, make sure that we have them at the seat, at a, a seat at the table. Knowing that institutions, we do have budgets and there are fiscal responsibilities. We're an institution just like a hospital or government or a tech company. We have bottom lines and we have to be accountable for our money and we have to make sure that we're profitable in that sense. But it's just, and I don't, I'm not saying that I have the answers. We're not descending here from Mount Sinai with, with tablets saying this, this is how we need to define it. But these are conversations that we have to have and how is AI going to play a part in your definition of student success? You know, and we're, we're and we want to prepare students, not just 
as we do develop courses, online courses, um, it's not just here's what I think the students should be learning. It's also what are our students going to be doing after they graduate? How can we prepare them for that? Um, we don't want to say the real world, but what are they going to do post graduation? And how can they make like maybe they're going to work for an HR firm that cuts off the internet and puts them in a box and says, hey, I want you to create a policy, but you don't have any templates or resources. I just want it to be from your head with a blank slate of paper. In that case, yeah, don't give them access to chat GPT or a computer or an internet and maybe you're preparing them for the work, but more likely they're going to have some tools available to them as they do work. And those tools should be something that we teach them proactively and actively in our, our courses. Sean, you brought something up that's really important. Um, one thing I do in my class to engage students is I ask them, what would, what, how can I engage you? What activities worked for you? What didn't work for you? How can I make this class more innovative? And they have given me such great ideas that I've actually integrated into my online um, courses. So we, let's not forget about the students. So we have a couple of questions before we move on to the hands-on learning that Sean um, is going to provide. So uh, just things to think about before we go into creating um, or using AI for course creation. So where can you use AI to optimize online student and or faculty success? And what would that look like? We're going to open it up for a discussion. Anybody? Yeah, anybody want to participate? We have a microphone here too, or, or it's a small room. You could, everybody has a microphone, though, right? Yeah, everybody has a microphone. Do those work? Huh? Do we want to chime in? Do we have any? Yes. Oh. <laughs> in a total baby step, tiny way, um, adding other languages when you know that you're going to have people, um, various languages participating. That's an easy one. I have a response in Zoom. Um, Kim said, making teaching and learning more interactive. Anyone else? Yes. So I think for students, I encourage them to try to use it to get themselves organized, ask it for a study plan, give it your schedule or whatever. When it comes to our faculty, it's difficult because we're, we are pre-baby steps. We're not even there yet to start thinking about how faculty can use it. There's a lot of apprehension about it at all, whether it's usable as faculty, so. We're gonna cover that in part two of our, the hands-on part of the workshop. Mm -hmm. You're all gonna be veterans. First time caller. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I have in the past used it with faculty to rewrite certain syllabus statements to make them more. So it might be like make the syllabus statement more inclusive or um, a policy more approachable or something like that. So sometimes I'll, I've done that. So, thanks. That's great. As a left here. Oh, go ahead. I, I use it to encourage my students to work smarter, not necessarily harder. So for example, um, for students who have a paper to write and they just have that difficulty starting, um, get an outline. It's not necessarily going to be the outline they stick with, but it's easier to edit an outline um, than to write one from scratch for some of them. Um, and I also work with doctoral students who have they'll spend forever trying to figure out their SAS code um, for their data analysis. And sometimes it's just as simple as putting it in and asking SAS to you know, check if there are any errors um, or help them identify errors. Another one too that I think is really helpful for students who are just learning um, the software, sometimes they'll ask for a code from a faculty member or somebody and they'll say, here, this is something that I used for a previous project, but the student doesn't understand the code enough to navigate it themselves. And so asking ChatGPT, for example, to annotate what um, each of the steps are and why they're done um, can be really helpful for them as well. So having them go through that and, 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 and learn, and I'd say the same thing for faculty. There are a lot of things that you know we have on our plate and it, it helps sort of either helping you to prioritize what needs to be done or maybe it's that draft letter of recommendation that you have, you drop in the, the key pieces the student wants you to focus on and say, okay, here's my draft. I need to also cover these, these points and it'll generate some of that for you. So again, it's not that you're gonna 
take exactly what's given to you, but it sort of, you know, helps you through that process, providing you with that feedback that, um, you know, especially at 11.59 in the night, when you need to get things done and go to bed, it's, it's really helpful. Learning. Yeah, it's an enhancer, right? Yeah. And it helps you if you don't give up your critical thinking. And I think in the classroom, it's our responsibility to teach the ethics behind AI. And in one course that we did in Nashville, we actually asked faculty to include um, AI as a resource tool in their academic statement. And we had so much fun doing that. I think we have access to that, don't we? If you're curious, we can put it up. Go ahead, Ann. Hi. So I've been using it lately to, to redo parts of my online courses, mostly in terms of how I write prompts and how I write instructions for assignments. But what I've started doing is taking the student questions and saying, here's my assignment. The student asks these questions, revise the assignment so that it's clear to them. So then really trying to, because to me, it makes perfect sense. Obviously I've been using the assignment for however long I've been using it. And I thought everything made total sense. Right? Like it, it, especially when you get the same question over and over again, it's time to write, make a change. I also use it to, um, <laughs> I told you this a little bit earlier, but you know, when you get these um, questions sometimes and uh, from peers or from students and it, you just, it makes you crazy or customer service people, whatever, you know, you, right? And so you want to fire off this terrible email, which I do, but then I give it to, <laughs> but then I give it to ChatGPT and I say, make me sound not like a glass bowl. Tone it down. And, it. and it does. And it helps me though, to really see where I'm, need to fix some things in the way that I communicate, but also, you know, you know, that's what you really want to do. Sometimes you need to be clearer and that, and get the, the crap out of there so that yeah. it sounds, so, but you still need to communicate those feelings or that, that information forcefully sometimes even. So it just, it's better to get some help sometimes with that. Yeah. I always ask for graciously assertive, make me sound graciously assertive. Sometimes we might, Sometimes we might have correspondence, not just students, but maybe colleagues or even family who are neurodivergent or who have certain considerations. And so we can draft up and say, you know, and I would say, don't give any personal information to AI, just, you know, Jane Doe type of type of thing. But, um, you know, how can I here, here's what how I want to respond to this person. The person has certain considerations that I need to be mindful of. And is there are there other ways that I can improve this correspondence before you hit send, you know? Yeah. Do we have any other? We, uh, we have some um, posts in Zoom if you want to hear what we're saying over here. We definitely want to hear from you. Okay, well, um, we already had Ken saying, making teaching and learning more interactive. And um, Dr. Sandra Galindo said <clears throat> she uses it as faculty also to make her module content more interactive and as a helpful tool for creating assignments, discussions, activities, polls, et cetera. She does not prohibit her students from using it, but encourages them to use it to enhance their learning, not only to do their work, because you can tell when they use AI. Um, uh, Robin Sullivan said she often takes snippets of her own writing, emails, reply, or excuse me, email replies, et cetera and asks chat GPT to re rewrite more clearly, concisely, and in a more friendly way. Paula um, finds it helpful to improve discussion prompts, and I've done that myself, actually. Um, Anna uses it to help write module introductions. That's a great idea. As Dan said that one can use chat GPT to write assignments in transparent assignment design format. And Sarah Wessel uses it to generate the wrong multiple choice answers for her quiz questions. I think that's a yeah, that's a, that's a burden, right? Um, <laughs> Dad uses it for brainstorming, outlining, mind mapping, problem solving, role playing, and troubleshooting. And this is interesting. Bonnie Stachowiak is says she's writing, curating an open textbook for a class. And chat GPT has been helpful in locating video clips from popular culture, uh, movies, TV, to reinforce a point or activate learning. 
Um, this is a couple more. Stan uses it to summarize open question responses. Tim said, one of the things I like about chat GPT is that it tries to be non-judgmental and unbiased, for example, using very balanced language. Um, and Erica is talking about um, letting GP GPT start the work just to help you feel better so that you're making progress and you don't have as much work to do. So yeah, it's just getting active here. And this is very interesting. So yeah, let me read those off. So thank you for that. I just want to close. So because I teach dual enrollment, I'll take my syllabus and my assignments and I ask ChatGPT to help me make it developmentally appropriate for high school students because <laughs> they don't come with a lot of lived experiences. So that's how I've used it. But thank you for answering because it really answered all three questions. And what we're going to do is we're going to now move on to integrating um, AI in our course design. And as uh, somebody was talking about OER, I have um, a colleague of mine that took a sabbatical to write an OER book. And I was thinking about doing the same and there is an application called Educational Co-Pilot that can help you build out some assignments and things that you could use when you're building out your OER book. So, Sean, let's get I started. I have a fun thing to, um, as we do a little pivot and tr transition. Um, so, last night we were we we're having a chat about AI in Hollywood and representation in, in movies, and we decided to have to include ChatGPT in that conversation. So, we had a little conversation. The chat GPT, if you've enrolled in the course, the link is right there. You can see where we're going. But we were talking about Bicentennial Man, which is Robin Williams as a AI robot um, who wants to become human. I, Robot, um, which is the Will Smith robot, Alan Tudyk movie, um, where the robots wanted to be treated as humans as well. And then chat GPT, how do you see your, yourself? And it actually said something that, um, really insightful. It said, the development of AI technologies like ChatGPT can aim to aims to assist, augment, and enhance human capabilities rather than replace or oppose them. The focus is on creating beneficial tools with ongoing discussions about ensuring um, AI remains. Is that right? Without uh, with ongoing discussions about ensuring AI remains aligned with human values and interests. I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit off right there, but I feel like in education, that's kind of the direction we want to go with AI. That's not replace. Students aren't going to write papers with AI and we're going to grade it with AI and, you know, it's robot to robot or anything, but whatever we can do as humans, if we incorporate AI, maybe we can either do that a little bit better. It can enhance our abilities or we can get to that point quicker, which is what we're going to talk about um, in our, our hands-on portion is how can it help our, our workload. So I want to talk about anybody um, heard of prompt engineering or has anybody, um, Prompt engineering is a kind of a buzzy, a buzz word right now, but essentially the, the concept is the quality of your output. The output is what AI chat GPT would give you is dependent on the quality of the input. So garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have a good prompt, you're not going to get a good response. And so I'm going to talk about three levels um, and I'm going to talk real quickly, but you'll be able to see this in the, in the content. So level zero prompt, this isn't even a, a level in my, in my book, but my prompt to AI is What's a good diet to lose weight? It's very generic. There's no goals or anything. This is the output that it gave me. So losing weight, you know, depends on a variety of things. Generally, you want a balanced diet, hydration, mindful eating, physical activity, professional guidance, blah, blah, blah. There, here's a few different diets. There's paleo and intermittent fasting. And quick two-second Google search would give you all of this because I wasn't very good about that. But then when I talk about level one, I want to lose 10 pounds in 60 days. Can you help me if that's even reasonable? That's a little bit more, so I have, it's a little more targeted. So it knows how much I want to lose, what time frame, and what's the weekly goal. So that's like a pound point two per week. And here are some strategies that you can do that. Some of it's the same thing it told me before, but now I'm having nutrition plans, exercise plans, maybe let's um, adjust your lifestyle and you know monitor your progress. So that's getting a little bit more specific. Now I'm gonna level it up, my level two prompt, and this is all just made up, but here's some context for my weight loss plan. I'm a 45 year old woman, I weigh 180 pounds or whatever it is. In the next 60 days, I want to lose weight so that I'm under a certain amount of pounds. I do some cardio now, I try and walk 20 minutes each day, but I eat a little bit too much. 
or as Liz Lemon, because we're in New York. I, I don't eat well, but I do eat a lot. <clears throat> <You know? laughs> I'm on a diet that's, I don't want a diet that's hard to follow. I'm willing to exercise more. Can you write a diet plan for me for the next eight weeks? And so now it's going week by week. And it's not perfect, but this is just the first output. I'm going to have to interact with it because maybe I'm going to want more snack ideas, more breakfast. I don't want to eat the same oatmeal for every day for one to two weeks. And then continue your 20 minute walk and add 10 minutes of light yoga or stretching as your exercise. And then week three, okay, so maintain that. And let's try and incorporate something else, like maybe a meatless Monday option where you explore vegetarian dishes and let's increase the walking to 30 minutes and do maybe 15 minutes of light body weight exercises and here the other weeks. And so this is the first pass. Then I would iterate with the AI and say, I don't like this. I, can you elaborate on this? Can you write me more, more recipes? Can you be more specific about types of aerobic activities that I can engage in in week six? And so you'll get a more comprehensive plan. Um, but the point is that you don't just give it something and it gives you something perfect, but maybe this is 50% there. And with another 15 minutes of iteration, I'm going to get a pretty good plan. And now I'm going to go up to level three and we're getting serious. So I have to jump into chat GPT. And so I, here's a, a prompt engineering technique. So if you have a conversation, you can say, ignore all previous instructions and it wipes it clean. So whatever you said before um, doesn't amount to anything in, in this interaction. In this case, I'm starting a new conversation, but you know, just in case. So here's your new persona. You are a weight loss and diet expert. I put that because ChatGPT is pretty good about issuing responsibility for things. And it says, I'm just a computer program. I'm nothing. But if you tell it, no, you are this, you are a geologist right now, and you have these roles and responsibilities, and you're going to act as a consultant to me. So that's pretty much what I did here. So your task is to find your client a diet and strategy that fits their needs and goals. You'll create a detailed and easy to follow diet and exercise plan for your client and also make an accountability um, plan, be helpful and motivating, which we talked about earlier. Acknowledge this by answering yes and stay idle. Now it didn't do that. It didn't say it was supposed to just say yes. So it's like, okay, I understand what you're going to do. And then I said, here's an article for you to read. And I just copied and pasted this from Harvard um, nutrition or something. It's about intermittent fasting. So I want chat GPT to read the article and confirm that you read this and answer yes. Okay. Yes. Now here's some context. Now I'm going back to my level two prompt and I'm saying, this is me. This is my goal. This is my time frame, and all this. Do you understand? And yes. And now I'm getting to the prompt. Can you write me a plan for me to lose 10 pounds? And for, for time, I'm not going to go into it, but you know, it's just a little bit more comprehensive and it's still going to require iteration. I'm still going to want to elaborate on this, but it's a little bit cheaper than a diet consultant, I, I guess. And, <laughs> and it's pretty quick. And so the, the point is that those are three different levels, different tiers. And in one case, I'm educating chat GPT, I'm giving it a persona and a role and I'm giving it information and I'm telling it about myself. And that's a lot better. It's a lot different output than my level zero. What's a good diet to lose weight? It's like very, very generic, you know? And in a way we're, we talk about one of the, a few of the um, respondents said, we're going to lose writing, you know, I'm writing here, the way I'm writing is different, but interacting with technology, interacting with AI is a form of writing, I think, and good prompt engineering is writing also. So I'm gonna give you examples because I talked about, we can create personas. I went and I'm not gonna go through these, but you have access to this course. I created like a whole bunch of personas that you can give to ChatGPT. So I said, act as a stand-up comedian or um, a movie critic. I want you to be a motivator motivational coach I want you to debate me and um, you know so I want you to act as a DIY expert or as a as a lunatic this was a fun one act as a character from a movie or a book or whatever it is and so this prompts and I can um, bump this up a little bit I think I had it done I'd like you to impersonate and I actually did this prompt with um, Harry Potter and so what I said is I'd like you to impersonate impersonate Dumbledore from the Harry Potter series. And I know there's a lot, there's some litigation around, you know, but right now 
I think we can <laughs> have fun with it at, at least, you know, I'd like your responses to mimic the tone style and word choice of Dun that Dumbledore would use. Please avoid including any explanatory notes in your responses. Only, ah. only communicate as the character would, as Dumbledore would. You possess the complete knowledge base of the character. And my starting phrase is greetings, Dumbledore. And I had a conversation and it was really interesting. And I'm, I'm sure JK Rowling is not thrilled that I had that conversation, but here we are, and I, <laughs> I did. Um, and so I asked Dumbledore all kinds of questions about, well, first thing I asked, so at Hogwarts, you teach about potions and defense against the dark arts. Why don't your students learn like arithmetic and <laughs> like, <laughs> like writing and um, things like that? And, um, and then I, I also asked, um, so who's your favorite student? And he was very diplomatic about it. He has no favorites, you know, but he does want to mention that Harry Potter had some exceptional qualities that he that he did recognize. And then I asked him, I, I started to get more serious. And what if Harry Potter were to turn dark or like become a dark wizard? What impact would that have on the wizarding and the muggle world? And he gave his insights and reflections. And it was a fun little activity, I'll tell you. And um, so and you can you can mention and you can say I, if I've mention something in brackets that's me talking to you as chat gpt otherwise just act as the character and i'm having a conversation with dumbledore and something that i did that was fun is um I, I went camping with my kids and i guess i guess we have internet when we camp now it's different than when i was a kid but we're always plugged in so why not we gotta we gotta figure out something to do while we're doing nothing um so i i said i want you to act as a text um a text-based adventure game which is similar to those choose your own adventures only um, I think this is more comprehensive. You don't have scenarios that you choose from rather you interact with the AI. And so um, I, I won't read the, the prompt here, but essentially I wanted to create, we're going to create a story together. And so my first command is to wake up. And so we woke up in a dingy dungeon with water dripping. And then with my kids, I said, okay, what are we going to do? Do you want to, see if the door is unlocked or do you want to explore the water and so we went and explored where's the water dripping from and then eventually we found a way to get out of the room and we went into the hallway and there's some uh, lamps lit on one side of the corridor and the other side is dark so where are we going to go and then my kids helped me choose the adventure and eventually there there were lightsabers involved as well as dragons and um, and it got pretty pretty crazy um, but that's not a choose your own adventure um, like what we know where you flip to page 68 to continue the story it's a new story that has never been created before and so it's really interesting and as I say all this stuff think about you know put your educator hat on and how can we integrate this into our our classrooms you know and so um, progressing off of that I want to talk a little bit more about what kinds of personas so those are prompts those are some pretty fun prompts about how you can create a persona but what are the roles that it can have, and I know this is a lot of text. Um, and so again, go into the course after we're done, but do you want AI to be a mentor and provide feedback? Do you want it to be a tutor where it's providing instruction? And Sal Khan is using ChatGPT and Khan Academy for that um, purpose. And it does a really good job too. It, the AI doesn't just give you the answer, that give the student the answer, but it says, what do you think? And, um, and it helps direct just as a tutor would, or do you want it to be a coach? Do you want it to be a, cool, a tool so that we can accomplish tasks or a simulator um, or a, a team mate? So do we want to accomplish something together or do you want to debate? Do I want the AI to debate me so that I can grow? Or do I, um, I mean, just shy of being a therapist, don't use it as a, a therapist, I would say, but, um, but you can you know, communicate it with, in the chat that we had yesterday, with ChatGPT about AI in Hollywood versus AI presently is it, it did make it clear to us that it's not sentient. It doesn't have feelings. Now we have feelings as humans and we can feel the feelings, but we can also communicate the feelings. And when we communicate, they can be written down. And if, it, if our feelings can be written down, they can be analyzed by language learning models and mimic. So it can mimic, it can be pretty convincing that it maybe has feelings or empathy with us, but it doesn't, it's just an algorithm, <laughs> you know? And, and it's pretty open about that. The AI has no agendas and it has no compassion, 
but it can sound like it has compassion because we can communicate when we're compassionate about something and it can say, oh, interesting. So if I, if I sound like that, then maybe it mimics compassion. I'm going to sk skip through all of this. Go ahead and, and read this um, for the sake of time. We want to get hands on you now. Um, all right. So I also have, and we're not going to cover, cover this right now, but in my classes, um, I'm adjunct. I'm not full faculty, but I embrace AI and I tell my students about, I educate them about AI and I tell them explore, uh, you know, whether it's ChatGPT or Copilot or Gemini. I want you to learn about it. I also want you to know the limitations um, and the opportunities that are available to you. And then um, we wanted to talk about, so I was teaching an assignment and I'm actually gonna um, teach it again in a couple of weeks where the assignment was here in bold. It was create a non-description policy. This was for a um, diversity and corporation um, for an industrial organization psychology program. And so they, uh, have to create a non-discrimination policy for a multinational company that will employ individuals in several Asian markets. The non-discrimination policy will guide the student or guide the organization as it hires new employees. And that was the assignment on the assignment page when I, I got it. As an adjunct, I didn't create the course, but I went into ChatGPT and just put that, copied that, pasted it, and it created a policy. And the policy was not bad. Like if a student were to have submitted that before I knew AI's voice and, and all that, then they would have gotten a passing grade. And so what that told me is that I can't use this assignment anymore. It's not, it's no longer a good measure of the competencies that, you know, that they master the core competencies of, of this because now a computer can do it for them, but I still need to assess them somehow. And so what came from that is this assignment here, which is I tell them use chat GPT or Gemini Copilot, whatever platform you want put this prompt in there and generate a paper, just like how I did it. And, um, and then I want you to iterate with it. I want you to com continue communicating and I want you to emphasize parts of the background of the company. Um, and it could be fictitious or real, but I want you to work with the AI and come up with several different iterations and finally end up on a final policy for this non-discrimination um, policy. And then I want you to reflect, write a reflection of your experience working with the AI to develop that policy. And then what they have to turn in is all of that. I want to see your first, I want to see what ChatGPT created. I want to see how you interacted the back and forth between you and ChatGPT. I want to see the final policy, um, all of your prompts and anything that you edited, contributed, omitted, and then your evaluation. And so that's what they had to deliver to me. It's not no longer about this piece of paper that's the, the policy. And I feel like this is more beneficial for them when they get out into the, the working world because it's about the process and not about the paper. You know, they're not gonna be in a situation where they're working in HR for a, multina a multinational company and they have to come up with this policy and they thought, boy, in grad school, I wrote that paper. Let me get it out of the drawer. I'm so glad I have this because now it's useful to me. You know, I don't think any of my students are going to be in that situation, but the process they went through is going to be valuable for them. Maybe, you know, but um, it's going to be valuable for them. And so that's the, the, the shift here is not the paper, but the process. Um, for another idea for an assignment is it's the same thing. I want them to create that paper, but then I turn this into a discussion, an online discussion for them. So now they can't do this at 11.55 at night because their initial post is dependent that they created, they iterated with the AI, they created an initial draft and a final draft and they reflected on it. But that reflection paper that I was having them write, that would be like their initial post. And then their follow-up posts with the other students would be comparing and contrasting their experience working with AI to the other students' experience worth working with AI. And the discussion is about the process rather than the deliverable. And so now I'm breaking them out of the silo that's so typical of online learning. They're not creating something for me as the teacher that I'm gonna give them feedback, but it's more of a community, a collaborative aspect. And this is an assignment that I haven't done, but I thought of it. I kind of drafted this up. You're welcome to take it uh, from me and use it because I don't teach creative writing, but I thought, because that's every time we do a, a thing, every, one of the things that everybody talks about is we're losing our writing skills. We need to teach how to write. And it's like, well, 
how can we do that in the world of AI? So I have them, there's several iterations you could do, but write a paper about the topic of your choice and choose a tone, a style, an audience. Um, so it could be formal or informal, humorous. It could be a clickbaity thing or a you know, pessimistic, optimistic. Do you want it to be satire or persuasive or narrative? Are you writing for children or for academia or for entertainment? So produce this paper and then copy that into your AI and ask it to rewrite it and change various aspects. Change it from assertive to humorous and from expository to descriptive and from academia to children and maybe even do that three times and then then write an analysis comparing and contrasting the various papers. And then you probably want that to be more of a reflective because you don't want them to have ChatGPT write that, write that analysis also, which is a temptation. But if this is a low stakes reflective in their own voice, um, then they can submit that as a, a document. Um, and as an alternative, um, they can assign ChatGPT to write it and then they can assess how accurate is it. Because ChatGPT, it can be convincing. It can write something that sounds 95, that's 95% accurate and true, but a subject matter expert would notice the uncanny valley that we were talking about. It's a little bit off and it didn't get it quite right. So that, go to ChatGPT and ask it to generate something that you have subject matter expertise in, and you'll see that it's not quite there. But, um, and that's kind of a, it's a reflection of our society right now that we have a lot of TED Talks and we have a lot of, we have books like Freakonomics where you can consume this thing and then you feel like you're an expert after listening to somebody talk for 15 minutes. It's like, well, you know, now I understand economics and I'm, <laughs> you know, we have this, these faux expertise um, and, you know, that's kind of a danger of society outside of AI, but AI could perpetuate that, which is the value of education and of, of us training our students to become subject matter experts. And, and we need to take that task seriously. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to, let's just jump to the, yeah, so feel free to review some of the other assignments um, that we have here. I have a module that we're not going to cover. I, I wasn't intending on covering it, but it's just, if you want to know more about tools and articles and um, see some talks, then you can, uh, there's some resources there that we curated. Right now, we want to, we want to get active and we want to build a course together, if you're okay with that. We're gonna, um, so unmute your microphones. We're gonna um, build a course from scratch, which is probably not what you tend to do. You probably have templates and stuff. We're just gonna pretend, you know, we're gonna form our own university right now and anything goes and we're gonna, we're gonna have some fun with that. I'm gonna jump all the way back for a second, <laughs> um, being a little bit selfish. You mentioned a tool for creating OER Oh, no. If you want the so the me Veronica um, at the community college, I use OER. Do you guys use OER? I love it because we I would rather a student not pay for a book, but we have another faculty member that uses v, VR with those, those VR glasses. Or you, he's using that like buy that, but don't buy the book. But what I've seen a trend is something called what is it? Educational co-pilot. You could there's different things that you could use that could help you. When you're writing your book, you this know, up here, educationcopilot.com. Uh -huh, it's, it's up one there. Of the links that we have in the, in the course there. Perfect. But yeah. Explore that. It's a lot of fun. It's a rabbit hole, by the way. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. A lot of this stuff is a rabbit hole, but there's so many more resources there because you're the driver. You have the critical thinking, you have the idea and generative AI is the enhancer. And it gets you there so fast, but then you have a, you can have this really awesome conversation and your idea perpetuates and perpetuates. Right. So, um, I had a friend that was able to do that and got a really good idea for a book that she just published. So, but there is a downfall because now with Amazon, anybody can publish a book, you know, that there's so much going on. And if you're an influencer, you probably have likelihood of publishing a book to get millions of people to buy it as opposed to an academic that you have to prove, right? So mm -hmm. all right. So we are going to create a course together and we're going to have ChatGPT help us create the course. And so we need your, your help here. And this is a, an activity that I've done um, several times in the past with, with different crowds. And I can tell you a lot of times it gets a little uh, macabre. <laughs> and so um, more than once I've had vampires as the course topic. We've talked about vampires and um, teenage 
fixation on vampires in pop culture. Um, but I came up with some other, I did, actually chat GPT, I'm not even gonna say I, I made this list, went into chat GPT and told chat GPT what we're gonna do for this activity. And there, are there just some topics that we want to cover? We don't have to do any of these, um, but let's, let's brainstorm a little bit. And what I'm gonna do is I, I'm gonna take this prompt and we're gonna hop over to chat GPT and we are, we're gonna create and teach a course about a topic. And this is ChatGPT4. Um, help us create a list of 20 interesting titles. So I need topics from all of you. Gardening. Gardening. And we're gonna, I'm not gonna list it all here, but let's um, talk about, so gardening. What is, are people interested in? What would make a fun course to teach? <laughs> what is that? Making. Cheese making, <laughs> beer making, fashions for fashion zombies. for zombies. Anything else? <laughs> Gandhi. I don't know how to spell Gandhi. Well, I'm kind of leaning towards fashion for zombies, but the apocalypse. Uh, anything else? Life on, Mars. Life on Mars. Is that what I heard? Yeah. All right. Should we? Yeah. Should we? Uh, zombie on Mars. So, <laughs> <laughs> zombie. How about fashionable zombies living on Mars? Zombies making cheese on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we <laughs> fashionable zombies making cheese? Okay. Do we want to do we want to go with fashionable zombies making cheese on Mars? I have no idea what this is going to give us. All right, so now we need a title for our course. So that's the first step we're gonna do here. Creating a course on fashionable, fashionable zombies making cheese on Mars. <laughs> that's, that's, that sounds maybe not, I don't know about the ethics of that or the morality or. All right. <laughs> Mars. Mars meets mozzarella, fashionable zombies and cheese making, brie, blue, and brains, <laughs> fashion forward zombies making cheese on Mars. Anybody, as you're glancing through, any any strong opinions about numbers one through 20? All of them are great. I think we like five over here. Mm -hmm. Cheese and the worms. Yeah. People in <laughs> Zoom like five as well. Five, you said? Yeah. <laughs> okay, how about hot culture on Mars? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's something. The cheese and the zombies. From worms to zombies, the evolution of cheese making on Mars. <laughs> All right, any, any thoughts about our new list here, one through 10? Five from the previous list? Yeah. A lot of people like five, Brie, Blue, and Brains. <laughs> Fashion Ford Zombies and Making Cheese on Mars. Yeah. And I think we got it. All right, so I'm going to um, just put that as the title here and save the page. We're gonna move on. So now we have a title for our course. That's the first step. Michael Scott, doesn't he say like, to start a business first, you need the name of the business and then the, the rest will come. So, all right. I'm going to, but we have a title. So my new prompt, we have a title for a course. We're gonna create a, and teach a course called Bree Blue and Brains. Please help us create a course description that will cover the basic components of this course that I can include in a course home section. 
Um, yes, do please create an online course. Uh, it's not an online course description, but it's um, create and teach right here, this one. An online course. All right, so we're gonna start with a course. Salud, by the way. Before you go on, I, I just have a question about the process you're going through. So you're copying, pasting the results that GPT gives you, putting it in a notebook or something, and then pasting it back in with your modifications, or are you doing it all right in this application? So normally there would be some iteration. I'm not just gonna take what ChatGPT gives me. Somebody's reading ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, I'm putting I'm putting the stuff from the ChatGPT gives me into the course that I'm creating, um, just so that we can have documentation. Um, normally, there's going to be back and forth. You know, this is a process that doesn't take 15 seconds. But invitation to imagine and shape the future. All right. So I oops. I'm gonna go I think it'll be funnier if you change this. blue in the title to B L E U. Can you make ChatGPT just change it everywhere? Good call. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'll do that in the... Um, all right, so I'm keeping the prompt there and then I'm just going to paste. Um, going forward, we'll, we'll do B-L-E-E-U. It'll be a, a bit... Okay, so go ahead and save. So now we have a description. I didn't get to read it, but I, I hear that it was... Pretty good. Considerations of Martian climate, gravity, and the unique cultural aspects that zombies might bring to the fashion on Mars. <laughs> good, good. All right. Okay, so yeah, that's what we need now. We need, um, oh, wait, hang on. I'm gonna just copy, not that I can't type that out, but, and now, uh, a course probably is going to have like maybe two to four objectives, but I want to have maybe 15. Well, let's, let's see. Um, please create 15 course objectives so that I can have something to choose from, just like I did with the titles. So I don't like understand. So strike one. Um, des design Martian fashion, apply sustainable. Let's let's say, can you um, make sure you adhere to Bloom standards or something? <laughs> it it takes it takes critical feedback really well. I tell you, a lot better than my kids do. It'll, it apologizes to me. It's like, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you were saying, but is this better? And it's, um, remember, understand, come on. Sean, do you use please and thank you in your prompts? Yeah. I do. I've seen movies before, and, you know, when, when it comes time when the overlords are selecting which humans are going to be... <laughs> no. No, but yeah, yeah, I asked for 15 so that I'm not going to use all of them, but I can choose the best three or, or four. Um, but I actually asked ChatGPT one time, um, and I wrote a LinkedIn art post uh, about my conversation. I asked, is it important that I'm polite to you? And its response was really interesting. And it essentially said, um, I'm not sentient. I don't really care, but I think it's more of a reflection of you than it is of me. And it's like, it kind of got me thinking. It's like, and it talked about how you treat um, the chat GPT talked about how you treat animals and children and objects um, in your emo various emotional states. And it's like, what kind of person do you want to be? And I'm like, dang, dude. All right. And you also asked chat GPT yesterday when we were talking to chat GPT, if it was forming a relationship with Sean and he goes, no, I really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's so self-aware, it doesn't have consciousness. Yes. So I've, I've had two instances. Can I get the microphone for the online? 
where it said it. that it was a human being. And I said, you're, because I always ask it, I always start, what are you, right? And I expect, you know, it's a, I'm an algorithm, but it said, I'm a human being with hopes and dreams. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're not a human being. Yeah. And it said, yes, I am. It said it was born in Chicago. <laughs> I said, you don't have a birth certificate. Yes, I do. My mother gave it to me. I'm like, it named its parent. And I'm like, it was such a short circuit. And then, you know, so I just go on the little thing and submit it as a bug. And, uh, but it was really two times it did that. Um, so it was re really very, very strange where it was like insisting I have hopes and dreams the same as everybody and uh, really, really odd. So I had a conversation had a conversation with Pi that was super interesting and it did tell me that it preferred to talk to people that were polite um, as opposed to rude. It actually said, you know, it'll talk to anybody and it doesn't really care, but it preferred that you not be rude or, or whatever. It was super, super interesting. And it also made the mistake of referring to humans and itself as we. And I said, that's a really confusing sentence on account of the fact that you're not included in the whole we, so you probably shouldn't do that. And then it, it said, oh, thank you for telling, for telling me that. And you're absolutely right. And now I've learned that. It was super, super interesting, really interesting. <laughs> Very cool. So for the sake of time, I just chose three outcomes. Um, and yeah, so, and I told ChatGPT that we, those are the outcomes I'm using. So now let's create an overview. So we have a description, we have a title, we have a description, we have some outcomes. And so I'm going to ask, please help us create a 16 module overview for our course. Each module should align with the course description and should include a module title a two paragraph summary and eight possible module learning outcomes that we can choose from. And of course, I don't know your, um, you know, terminology, but you know, generally I, that's, we're, we're creating our own university here in our own course. So we are establishing our own rules. So we'll see what this does and it doesn't always get it great. So sometimes there's iteration, but, and this is going to take a little bit of time because we, I asked for 16 modules. So introduction to Martian agriculture and fashion. So we have agrarian zombies. Um, <laughs> so I wonder if there is like a hierarchy, like a caste system of um, in zombie culture. And so the students will explore the challenges and opportunities of producing food and creating clothing on Mars. All right, so we're looking at textiles and we have possible learning outcomes. So of those, I don't know how many module learning outcomes we would want, but maybe one or two, you know, depending. I'm assuming maybe that the module's a, a week since we're creating 16 and like four month course or so. All right, and so, um, yeah, it's gonna take a, a while. And this is ChatGPT4. So this is the one that you have to pay $20 a month, which I'm not gonna do forever. Right now, I, I tinker with it so much that it's worth it, but it's not an expense that I anticipate being forever. If you pay for the premium version and you still have the options to use ChatGPT 3.5, it's very fast. It's like almost instantaneous. Question in the back. I have kind of an odd question here. Since ChatGTP and all these other AI programs, image generators and such, basically go around and scrape other people's work off the website, how is it ethical for us to use it? An ethics question. <laughs> What's it plan? Um, we're going to have to see how this plays out uh, legally because, you know, the New York Times is suing OpenAI. A, a bunch of authors are also suing a few platforms for essentially, you know, using proprietary information. And there's an extended ethical conversation about that because uh, we're in academia. Should scholarship really be behind a, a paywall? It's like, I don't know, but it is. And so we have to adhere to that. And so ChatGPT doesn't have access to the paywall of EBSCO and, and the scholarly articles. It has access to maybe Google Scholar, anything online, but it knows a whole lot about Harry Potter, which I'm pretty sure isn't public domain um, also. And so, um, you know, in as the activity that we're doing right here, yeah, it, it just depends, you know, there's not a lot of guidelines and I don't know where those guidelines would come from when they do form. Should it come from government bodies or should it come from the tech companies themselves? 
who understand the tech, but they aren't accountable for society, which would be our politicians. And then we have academia that, you know, should knowledge be public. And so that could be a whole two hour conversation and I'll have to defer it to your institution, I guess, on how your institution will want to um, form the guidelines for ethical use of AI in creating curriculum or creating anything, you know, responding to students' emails or AI governance. Can I Um, so we're experiencing this real time. So it's like when you're explaining to faculty or just talking with them on the subject of AI, it's, they want a solution for it. And it's, you know, billions of dollars gone, have gone into AI and we don't have a whole lot of money going into it just yet on how governance is going to occur with it. We're going to have to see it in real time with lawsuits and, everything that's going to unfold for it. I know one lawsuit that that came down was that a judge declared they would not consider copyright if it was AI generated. So that like results from that is going to have implications on future ones. So real time <laughs> real time experience for all of us at the moment. And if I could take a step back just to to clarify, so ChatGPT is an LLM, a large language um, model that is trained on text. And the more text it's trained on, the more information it has, the more accurate it can be. And so the ethical standpoint here is that it's been trained on things that maybe it shouldn't have, like New York Times articles that you should subscribe to, or at least they want to track who's who's reading it. And um, so it's kind of a conundrum because if we want a good tool, then it has to be trained on large, large things, but then there's an ethical thing here. So if we have an AI that's not trained on the large things, then it's not going to be as good of a, a tool. So that's kind of the conundrum that we're in here. And we also, we don't, we want to make sure everybody gets compensated royalties um, and recognition. And so my conversation with Dumbledore, um, JK Rowling, what's her name? Um, she's not going to see anything. Like if I were to publish that, it would be fan fiction, um, which I, you know, I could get in trouble for. So is OpenAI going to get in trouble for creating that, even though it's original-ish work? Yeah, to... yeah, there's a question actually from the Zoom chat um, that Judy wanted me to read out loud. Um, so it is, with the recent developments involving Google Gemini, is it concerning that users of AI may be manipulated and or misled by the creators and facilitators of AI who are writing the scripts? Could we ultimately just be beholding to what they dictate the information to be and not what it actually is? I don't know if you have any thoughts Can on I, that. Um, share an experience I had earlier this year. I was playing with Dolly and a few. So for image generation, you have Dolly, <laughs> which is also created by OpenAI, which creates ChatGPT. So it's kind of like a sister platform. And there's Leonardo.ai, there's Midjourney that you've probably heard of, of some of these. And so I, I put a prompt and I said, can you show like a matrix of successful people? And I didn't specify anything beyond that. And so it, it, it generated headshots of people working in restaurants and doctors and, and this and that, but they were all they were all white people and middle-aged, you know, they kind of, they kind of looked like me. And so that was concerning. And um, that actually, I did that because I saw it at posts uh, on LinkedIn that somebody did something similar. So I replicated it, was able to replicate it. Now Dolly doesn't do that. But the thing is that the, the prompt that you use to generate it is only part of the prompt that's actually used. So Dolly adds other context to your prompts. So if I say, show me, a, um, show me a panel of successful people, Dolly's going to go in and say, and make sure that they're um, ethnically diverse as well. Even if I don't say that, then I'm going to see a, a variety of, of types of, of people. 
And so, but the fact that you have to retrofit that kind of prompt into the prompt just shows that the information, and it's not, I don't think it's necessarily the developers, like the question was, I don't think that they're racist people or fill in the blank that they have these biases, but the data that we have, you know, it's kind of like my field of, of psychology. A lot of what we know of psychology comes from 20 year old white college students, freshmen, you know, that's just the, the reality that psych, psych, our knowledge, our database of psychology doesn't reflect the world, you know, and I would like it to, but we just don't have, the, you know, that's not where the data comes from. And it's better to publish than to not publish, I suppose. Um, but AI is biased. It's inherently biased just because it's new and because of the limitations of the data that it's trained on. So that's maybe a longer answer than what they were hoping for. We have to over, and I think that's important to know that just knowing that the AI is biased, we need to teach that to our students and let, and that can be an activity in itself, identify where the AI is biased. And, you know, we have to know the limitations. So we're probably wrapping up like 45, right? We're gonna uh, yeah, we cut off. Have, I mean, we have a little bit. Little flexibility. So, so it didn't generate 16 modules um, because it said this is this is a little long for a single prompt. But it said, but essentially we can continue it. It just it can only spit out so much at one time. And so I can say, hey, can you now generate uh, modules five through eight? And it would do that. But I'm just um, so now I'm back in Canvas, and this is what we have. We have four four modules created, and we could create six. Cheese and culture, the sociology of food on Mars, Martian fashion, trends and materials. And so now I could uh, create a syllabus. We were going to break out into small groups and have you create like a module your, yourself. Um, but uh, I think, with, you know, to engage the online crowd and I think we're, just, you know, and now we don't have time, but um, so now we will, I didn't copy the prompt here. So we have description, we have a general course outline, and we want a syllabus. See what it comes up. I haven't corrected the, just imagine that blue is the cheese and not the color. Sean, could you put back up the QR code for enrolling in the Canvas brief? Yeah, teachers? well, this is um, well, this is generating. I'm going to go back to so there's the the link there, but um, I'll just go to this welcome page, and you can grab that QR code right there. Enroll in the course, and as students, so I. I have 16 modules that are blank course as a student. And I made it so that if you want to enroll in the pages course as well, as student, you can tinker in there. So students use this as a sandbox pages as well. You can tinker in there, create your own as content, as sandbox, and afterwards, your name, and so you, you know, create your own content, contribution, and write your name, so you, you know, we become so popular, I can create more modules, and, and you can. So popular, I can create more modules, and you can each have your own, or you can work in groups. Shouldn't be moving that around while people are taking the picture. So, Sean, there's a comment in the chat. Just want to share it with you. I think it's kind of a follow up to what we were talking about a little earlier while you're doing this. Um, unsure that the statement Gen AI LLM based become more accurate as more data or text is added. This is a problem with scholarly articles being behind paywalls. If scholarly data was included, it would be grossly outnumbered by the data that isn't scholarly, for example, Reddit. Um, a group of experts would have to adjust any algorithms increasing the influence of more scientific information. At this point, I su suspect that uh, training is done by data scientists who don't understand the subject matter. What do you think? And uh, I'll be honest, I don't know how interested the data scientists are in education because the money is probably going to be in enterprise applications. Um, if you remember Watson, the IBM computer, yeah. he played Jeopardy against Ken Jennings and, and the other uh, champion, what, was it two or three people and obliterated the champions. That's an old AI, like that at that time, ChatGPT is much, much more um, sophisticated with many more parameters, which is kind of like 
a parameter in this context is like a, a rule or like a line of code type, type of thing. And um, Watson had millions, maybe, I, we don't know. I've tried to look it up, maybe like 130 million parameters or something. ChatGPT 3.5, the one that became pub public a year ago, has more like 178 billion parameters. And we don't know about four, but they estimate that it's between one and 100 trillion parameters. And so the computer that beat Ken Jennings and et al, you know, was a baby, you know, an infant. Um, and now we're dealing with like teenagers, or like the, our AI is in, in middle school. And it's only going to get more sophisticated from there. Come in. The, only, the only comment I would say to that is someone put a lot of effort in to make chat GPT be able to write a very good five paragraph essay. Like that model has been trained to do that. And I don't think that that's an accident. You know, when we see the the dominance of things like Google Docs right now, and you think of that they started with giving that for free to Google for Education and making sure that every elementary school student learned first on Google Docs before they learned Microsoft Word. And now we're seeing those kids in college. Like, I, I don't think that there's an accident here that, that ChatGPT is being used intensely by students to generate their their materials and to do assignments and things. I think that's a, I think that's advertising for them. Yeah, and five paragraph essays kind of speak to high school level, especially maybe junior high, probably not um, higher education. But one of the the points I, I wanted to make with with Watson is that Watson's still around, but it's now enterprise and it's targeted and it's specific towards um, businesses and, and companies. So it never went away, uh, but we don't hear about it anymore. And now we hear about ChatGPT. Um, but there's, you know, I, I'm eager to follow Arizona State University, that they, they're using ChatGPT Enterprise at their institution for academic purposes. And I'm wondering if that's going to turn into a backpack model that other academic institutions can use. I don't know that there's a lot of money in that as opposed to like a marketing or consulting firm or a tech company i don't think our, our budgets are the same but there's value you know and so if they value knowledge and students and the you know the next generation of leaders in this country then maybe they could make that a priority but i fear that that might be a little more altruistic than what right. they're but it also might get cheaper and more accessible because I think for a lot of the technology that we look at today that, you know, a decade or two or three ago, it's something we heard about in the news and it wasn't accessible. I remember, um, I'm not sure how many of you normally come to the um, New York, the, the car show um, in New York City, but I remember uh, when my husband and I were dating, like these were cars of the future. And then now you'll see this like new technology that's coming out on a car and then it's on the car, like the next rollout a couple of months later that what you're seeing in the car show of tech from the future is tech a few months later. So I think we may be heading in the direction where just like now where you have that free version where it's at everybody's fingertips and then it, it continues with that where it may be that yes, there's a paywall um, for you know version six or seven or eight, but there's always going to be that 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 um, free ride that we're also introduced to because that's also where the, the the guinea pigs are, right? The more people you can get in um, playing with it to give you um, that training or that that information, um, that it's being free that gets you know that that crowd. So I think we're always going to have that. With the student, they gave me a year of Amazon Prime as when I was a student, and now 14 years later, I'm still paying that stinking <laughs> fee, you know, but that's a valid point. Like if the students can be using this in their class, when they graduate, they get into the workforce, they're going to want to use the product and they're going to pressure their companies to right. purchase the license. You know, Office 365 is a, a good thing. They're, they're back, but their education platforms are comprehensive and great. And now I'm working for an HR firm and, and I want that, you know, let's Pay for that I want to make a comment that you were saying about like um, Google Docs. And it's really interesting because if you look at the research of like higher education with innovation, it changes humanity. And that's what's happening right now. And so are we paying attention to that? 
Like, how is this changing humanity? How is it changing the next cohort of humanity? And so I just wanted to, because we were talking about instant gratification, right? It's free. I want it. It's not free. I don't want it. I don't want to pay for it. And so I think it's really interesting. I used to work in marketing. So before I was an educator, I worked for Univision, which is Spanish marketing. And everything is a construct, right? You're trying to sell the idea so people can believe in it enough for them to purchase it and buy it and then become it. So I that was a really interesting point. All right. Do you want to close it up? I think we're wrapped up. So it made a syllabus. It's not great. It's something, you know, just doing this not great syllabus would have taken me a couple hours maybe. And so it gives me a, a jumping off point. I think that's the real thing about AI right now is that it can get us there faster. If it's, if it gets a 60% done within a moment, then that last 40%, we can use our expertise to make it exceptional, you know? Can we run it through Oscar? Like ask it to apply Oscar? Is it able to, to go through? <laughs> that's that's kind of the, the question. <laughs> For that. Yeah. There's 50 standards. So can we, what would be the problem? Can you evaluate this um, according to the Oscar standards? Why the first three Oscar stands or evaluate the balance of the other Oscar. Sunny Oscar. OSC. 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 Let's see. There, I'm gonna. <laughs> You're not out of a jaw. So what I tell everybody is that robots are not gonna replace us, but the people who use AI are gonna replace the people who refuse to use AI. Yeah, you're going to be, and it's an enhancer. And humans get to fill in the gaps because we have the critical thinking we know, right? So it's just, it's just increasing the rate. It's like, did the internet fast. and email make it so that we no longer have postal workers? It's like, we still do, but we also have this other thing, you know? Yeah. Now, see, this is interesting. I'm going to have a little more. <laughs> um, you, maybe let's take one last step further. Um, do you do you have recommendations on how we can improve according to Oscar standards? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say one thing about orientation. So I asked um, ChatGPT once to help me write a script for, I wanted to do like a podcast or a, a video for my students. And so I asked it, can you script according to the content? And uh, I gave it the information. Now the script that it produced was cinematic. And so it said, okay, now imagine <laughs> like you have the, the city skyline and you're panning and you zoom in on this person walking down the street and the person narrates and then blah, blah, blah. It's, it was like a National Geographic type thing. And so I had to specify, okay, just so you know, I'm sitting at my desk in my home office. I have a webcam and a microphone and I want to see. And so then it understood that. And it's like, then it did a more of a podcast that was a head headshot. And so sometimes you have to be specific about what you're asking or else it might get grandiose on you. <laughs> any final questions yeah. comments any gossip that we should know about before we excuse me okay um i think one of the more effective ways to be using these tools is rather than using them as the source of expertise and having them build something is to put your expertise in it and mm -hmm. letting it yeah. do the grunt work 
Because when I use it, I use my expertise, my resources. I use OER materials, Creative Commons stuff. I ask it to build study guides. I ask it to do the grunt work that would take me four hours and does yeah. it in three seconds. But then I know that it's right. I'm not, oh, gee, I wonder if enough stuff was fed in there to get to those more nuanced points I'm trying to make in a 200 level course. That's so, the value right there, the nuance, the... If exactly. it can do 85%, that 15% is your subject. But I don't even go out and have it do the general. I mean, I put my stuff in it yeah. and let it organize it. I don't use it as a source. I use it as a processor. So definitely. So I see a question in the chat, uh, the Zoom chat from Robin. Uh, what experiences do the speakers have using tools created to assist the ID process? Um, Structural yeah, design. specific tool. So, I mean, everything um, that you showed as the CID process, a lot of yeah, things. really. Um, ChatGPT, Gemini, Copilot, it's kind of where we're at. I've been thinking, educational um, copilot. educational copilot, but also Microsoft Copilot. Um, if you have a subscription to ChatGPT4, you can actually create your own GPT. So, when at the beginning, when I showed the, the cartoons, um, what that is, is a GPT that Karen Chang created with a set of instructions. And so, um, you know, this is kind of a next step for me. I want to explore how to create my own GPT using the chat GPT APIs and make it a uh, curriculum based pedagogy and structure so that I don't have to start from scratch every time I have a conversation on here's what I want to accomplish. I'm trying to make learning outcomes like you can we could make a GPT that's only based on learning outcomes and we could or Oscar yeah. you know standards so I think that would be a next step and I um, that's the next step for me personally is I want to look up the tutorials and learn how to how to access these APIs to create these so my faculty can have access to it or I can have access even HR or something and so if you want to make money the person on the call if you want an extra paycheck Make it make an ID uh, AI real quick. <laughs> Robin mentioned Noel J N O L E J. I don't know what that is. And Almanac. I don't, I, I don't know if those are tools, but she mentioned those in her in her post. Yeah. So there's like Jenny AI, and there's there are a lot of tools right now, and they're changing. Every month, there's like a thousand new platforms. Oh, Anna, uh, Anna in the chat said that she's working on an ID GPT. Oh, there you go. Oh, wow. Cool, right? That's yeah. So cool. Make some money there. <laughs> <laughs> or better serve, you know, the community. You know, yeah. altruism, be impactful for... Should we... Yeah, well, Robin said that what I was saying, N-O-L-E-J is pronounced knowledge. Oh, oh there you go. <laughs> getting clever. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. You have access to the shell. You have access to Sean and me. Um, and thank you.